Hello, this is George Vandeman. Today, It Is Written brings you Earth, Theater of the Universe, a fascinating but all too true unfolding drama of the ages, told in graphic art and stereophonic sound. I invite you to relax with a large white picture book in hand. Then move with me through the strange and significant controversy between Christ and Satan as described in the book of books, the Holy Bible. It will be a brief but thrilling overview of the entire book, from Genesis to Revelation. Unfortunately, this brief overview will of necessity have to limit much important detail, and even the mention of some of the picture truths on the various panels. But I sincerely hope that the inspiration of these few moments will so stimulate your desire to probe these truths further that you will do so. The scripture references at the base of each tabloid and the fascinating story describing them are all found in the book. They'll provide satisfying food for thought for some time to come. Now breathe a silent prayer for God's guidance and kindly open your book to panel one on pages 10 and 11. Then when you hear the music climax and drift into brief silence, it's time for you to turn the page to the next panel. So without further announcement, kindly watch for this brief, periodic silence. That's a serious question, and it demands an honest answer. Man in his desperate search for identity, for meaning and purpose in life, will never find the answers to his questions until he discovers the roots of humankind. We live in a world that is confused, violent, lonely, hungry, desperately looking for the answers to inflation, depression, the aged, war, rising crime drugs, unemployment, political corruption. Many seek refuge from the realities of life, from the pain of existence, in drugs or alcohol or in sexual conquests. But the alienation and hurt only deepens, and life becomes either one of deep boredom or a whirl of frightening complexity, the pressure even more unbearable. Amidst the conquests, the striving to achieve, the clamor to have, these basic questions press into our minds. Who am I? Where did I come from? Is the traditional evolutionary account of our origin true or only an educated guess? What is my real origin? What does my future hold? Somehow we get the feeling that we're on a runaway train on a downhill slope with no brakes, no conductor, and going too fast to get off. We cry out in our lonely hours, doesn't anyone care? Can't someone help us? Where is God? And we hear the answer. I have been here all along, my child, waiting for you to want me. Come, follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life I offer leads away from the confusion. I am the center of calm in which you can find refuge, peace, love, joy, purpose. You can learn all about your origin and your destiny. You can find it all in my word. Listen as the drama unfolds. In the beginning, God. God, the sound of the name, to some only known as profanity, to others reverent awe, to still others fear, stern, harsh, certain judgment. What is God like? Well, God is the kindest, finest, wisest father that ever lived, concerned about his children, always available, always listening. But he's more, infinitely more, incomparably more. Come with me through picture and sound, past blazing suns, past myriads of galaxies and island universe systems to the most beautiful spot in the universe. Time ceases to flow as celestial music breaks on our ears, music such as no one has ever heard before, a symphony of harmony and joy beyond our fondest dreams. We follow one of the host of messengers moving in and out of the light. 
we press in as closely to the center as we dare. Filled with the Spirit, clothed with the righteousness of Christ's making, we enter the light. All around there is celestial glory, exuberant joy, and infinite peace, and satisfying calm. Within the light is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, perfect, eternal, self-existent. The eternal three made a perfect universe, established it upon just laws, laws of love, of happiness, of service, that reflect what God is like. Into this perfect universe, God dared to place his newly created subjects endowed with free will, beings that could understand the principles of unselfish love and who would willingly live by them, beings who would love him as a natural response to his love for them, who would say, yes, I want to sing your praises, for you have given me life and breath and thought and a voice with which to sing, and I cannot be silent. But back to celestial harmony. The leader of the messenger host was Lucifer, son of the morning, highest of the created beings, one who stood next in authority to the Son of God. One day after the Son sat in council with the Father, the Son announced that they would create a new world and that they would make man in their image. The messenger host had always looked forward to these creative events with eagerness, but on this occasion, Lucifer, their leader, was strangely silent. Man in the image of God? What could this mean? Was this a threat to his leadership? He slipped away from the immediate presence of the Father. Why had he not been consulted in regard to the formation of man? Why was it that the Son was in the Father's counsel and not he? Why must he always bow in worship to the Son? And so began the questioning of God's motives, his judgment, his authority, his laws, his love. After all, he was a brilliant being, exceedingly wise. He knew that which was for his own best good. He didn't need law. He could live independently without the restraints and restrictions of God's government. Was he not the leader of the angelic hosts? He could be God. He would give his subjects greater freedom and a higher place in his realm. Quietly at first, he carried out his campaign to win the other angel messengers to his side. Emboldened when he suffered no apparent ill, he carried his campaign even higher. He sought to bring impeachment proceedings against the God of Heaven, marches, clandestine meetings, rallies, and finally, war in Heaven. How would it all end? Now, God could strike the rebels from existence, but would he? No, he had given his creatures free choice, and he would honor that freedom. Lucifer had raised questions that were not easily answered. In effect, God was now on trial before the entire universe by his own allowance. What action should he take? In long-suffering love, he would permit his beings to examine the fairness of his acts, and that would take time. Lucifer would be permitted to demonstrate the principles of his scheme. It would be a costly experiment. But the universe would at last be satisfied that God is just and holy and good and that Lucifer's plan would result only in ultimate chaos and ruin. Lucifer organized his forces and struck. There was war in heaven as Lucifer and his angels contended with the sun and the loyal angels for the throne. Dethrone him, cried Lucifer. Fight for your rights, impeach him, destroy him. I will give you freedom. Thus the authority of heaven had been challenged. Immediate action must be taken. In order to maintain the tranquility of the home and the integrity of the government of God, it was necessary to expel rebellious Lucifer and his sympathetic angels. Stunned and infuriated by this turn of events and realizing that it was now too late for him to turn back, he sought 
to rally the unfallen worlds to his cause. But no, they would remain loyal. Frantic at the rejection, Lucifer at last turned his attention to the newly created Earth and man. It was thus that the stage was set for the Earth to become the theater of the universe. A mighty host of angels and the sons of God gathered for the special event, singing as they came. Earth was about to be born. Into the dark void, God the Son stepped forward and said, Let there be light. And light flooded where only darkness had been. And then, well, with infinite resources at your command, how would you show how much you cared for someone very special to you? With rubies and diamonds, topaz and crystallite, Yes, and with birds and flowers, trees and waterfalls, an abundance of food, a golden sun, a silvery moon, and stars like diamond dust on the velvet curtains of night, with animals that leap and purr and whine, and order all under the influence of the infinite laws of a loving God. And into this world of beauty stepped man, carved from the soil, breathed into by the breath of God, and filled with the Spirit of God, and woman, the most beautiful creature of God's hand, beings that the Son brought forth to share with him the closest possible relationship, beings who were capable of cooperating with him in the future plans of the world, and perhaps even the universe. He had conferred upon man some of his own power, power to create after his kind, by an act of love that the earth might be filled with the joyful worship of God. He gave them power to reason, to evaluate, to invent, to choose, and to grow. Adam and Eve reveled in their new life, their new world. They rejoiced in the happy presence of their Maker, and they rested in Him, trusting Him for all of their needs food, shelter, love, companionship, and they rested in him on the Sabbath, God's special gift of love to man, that in worship and adoration, praise and fellowship, they might never forget their creator. Innocent, pure, a glow of light from the indwelling Holy Spirit, their only covering. God protected their happiness by withholding from them a knowledge of evil. Every thought was in harmony with the thoughts of God. Yet they were creatures of choice, and God must provide for that freedom. Beauty. A tree was placed in the midst of the garden representing the knowledge of good and evil. God faithfully warned them that if they touched it or ate of it, death would result. He told them the tragic story of Lucifer and of his plan to win them to his side. To the happy pair, the warning seemed unnecessary. They delighted in the life and the infinite prospects God had granted them. But Satan, planning his strategy with care, transformed himself into an attractive golden serpent 
and waited his opportunity at the tree, his only access to man. And suddenly, it was all over. His subterfuge, his deception, telling them that God had withheld something good, something that they would really make them happy, that they would become as God, that they wouldn't die. All heaven went into shock. The emergency plan of the Father and the Son made back in eternity was immediately put into effect. The plan provided that the Son would bear the guilt of the pair and all mankind. The Son, at that moment, in effect, gave up his throne and his glory to be surety for man, to return to it only if and when he successfully completed his mission to save the human family. Adam and Eve, now sensing their nakedness, the spiritual death that preceded physical death, were frightened as they heard the voice of God calling to them in the garden. They actually ran from that voice which once they had heard with gladness and tried to cover their nakedness. Then the excuses, the blaming, but the son did not accuse them. Rather, he lovingly told them about the plan that was now in effect, how they could rid themselves of guilt, receive complete pardon, conditional and mistake. The condition, by faith in the righteousness of the Son of God, they could be adopted back into the family of God. Man, they were told, could not save himself. His nature was now corrupted and weakened by a knowledge of sin. Only faith in the promise of a Messiah could save him. Adam and Eve must surrender their will to that of the Son. He would pardon them, make his innocence theirs, and give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He told them that one day he, the son, would be born into the human family, severing the link of the fatal chain of death that would pass on all men. And then, by an act of ultimate sacrifice, he would purchase their freedom by his own life blood, and at the same time forever seal the doom of Satan. And then, to illustrate God's plan to save man and to meet their immediate need, a lamb was slain. Their self-made fig leaf garments were removed, replaced with garments fashioned from skins, a covering purchased by innocent blood, a symbol of their eternal salvation. At that moment, however, man must be banished from his garden home to an earth plagued by broken laws, to return to the restored Eden only when the plan of salvation was completed. Eager for the promised Messiah, Eve, pregnant with her first son, Cain, wondered. Could this boy be the promised one? But Cain, rebelling against the explicit requirements of God, started his own form of religion, which led to jealousy and the murder of his faithful brother Abel. As time passed, there were many faithful men of God like Abel, but there were also unfaithful ones who followed Cain's example. Idolatry led them into satanic control, and satanic control into sensuousness, sensuousness to selfishness, selfishness to violence, until the earth was almost totally corrupt. God's Spirit pled with them through Noah for 120 years, warning them of coming destruction. Noah's message seemed to them but a fairy tale, a joke, a strange vision by a deluded old man. But then, for the first time in human history, rain began to fall. And Noah and his family of seven, safe within the ark, heard the muffled roar of the howling storm outside. The fountains of the deep broke open, and the vapor shield that protected the earth, making it a tropical paradise, collapsed. Water, water everywhere, finally covered the highest mountain. It was a different world that greeted Noah and his family when they stepped out of the ark 375 days later. Jagged peaks, deep valleys, barren deserts, frozen ice caps, from tropical paradise to a washed-out world. There was resentment in the hearts of some of Noah's family as they remembered how it was before the flood, in spite of the rainbow of promise. But Noah, thankful that he and his family had been preserved, 
bowed in humble gratitude to God. However, the seeds of resentment and rebellion grew until Nimrod, great-grandson of Noah, led a group of revolutionaries to the plain of Shinar. There he trained the young men in the art of war, the use of the horse, he inspired the building of large cities. He and his followers built a tower of defiance against God. Pre-flood religion was reconstructed with its idolatry, religious sensual practices, to which was added astrology, numerology, divining, along with the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Through Ishtar, the mythical goddess of the moon, and her illegitimate child Tammuz, was begun the worship of Satan's first counterfeit, mother and child. Tammuz, it was claimed, was conceived by the rays of the sun, and henceforth it was from the sun that pharaohs and rulers of many nations took their official names and from which they received their divine right to rule. Various forms of Babylon's ancient worship can be traced to almost every nation. Its practices have formed the basis for nearly every counterfeit religion in the world. Its mysteries and holidays, occult practices and holy days, traceable even into many so-called Christian groups where the signs and symbols of the enemy of God and man can yet be found. It was from the midst of such a highly developed system of diabolical deception in the Ur of the Chaldees that God called a man, a man who amid almost total satanic conformity on the part of the world kept his faith in God. God made a promise to this man, Abraham. From his seed, a great nation of faith would grow that would carry God's message of faith to all the world. God would teach them the principles of his everlasting gospel. And if they would believe and follow these principles, they would become the greatest nation on earth. And through Abraham's seed would come the promised Messiah. The promise was repeated to his son Isaac and to Isaac's son Jacob and to Jacob's twelve sons, from which the tribes of this great nation would grow. Read again the pathos and the deep meaning of the call for Abraham to slay his son Isaac, and the surprising and glorious outcome. Read again of Jacob's bargaining to secure his brother's birthright, and of the dream of the latter reaching from earth to heaven. And read again about that historic night when he wrestled with the angel of the covenant. One of Jacob's twelve sons, Joseph, sold by jealous brothers as a slave to Egypt, became in time of famine a savior to them. But God hadn't forgotten his promise. And at the appointed time, God called his people out of Egypt to the land that he had promised them. Remember the night of deliverance and the necessary blood on the doorpost, the exodus and the escape through raging waters on dry land, Israel's God was leading them, but the people were just too slow to understand. God performed miracle after miracle through Moses but the people refused to believe. He came down on Sinai's mountain and gave them his law, the principles of love which he wished to instill in their hearts, if only they would believe and obey him. But they rebelled until all but two of that faithless generation died in the wilderness without seeing the promised land. But please notice, God did not give his law on the mountain without a demonstration of the cross in the valley. There it was that a preview of Calvary took place. Read again and thrill to the scripture's description of this impressive passion play of the desert, demonstrated so that no one need misunderstand the provision God made for his salvation. Forty years later, another generation at last entered the land of promise. These two soon tired of God's rule and asked for a king like the other nations about them. God gave them first Saul, then David, and then Solomon. 
Solomon led the nation to heights of glory with the building of his magnificent temple, but also to the depths of degradation. In fact, he actually built for his many heathen wives the gods upon whose arms babies were actually sacrificed. Israel and Judah divided, both slipping unbelievably low in idolatry and immorality. Israel was taken captive by Assyria, and finally Jerusalem itself was destroyed, and the tribe of Judah with the royal household was carried captive to Babylon. Into the royal court of Babylon were brought those who were the pride of God's people, those who had not bowed the knee to Baal, but had grown wise and strong by adhering to the principles God had given them. Daniel, one of those faithful ones who interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a great metallic image, saw this mighty king converted to the true God of Israel. Daniel, I say, was privileged to see in prophetic symbol a parade of giant empires and nations that would reach to the end of time. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the nations of Western Europe as we see them today. These visions of Daniel would be used by God's people down through the ages as prophetic road maps pointed to the time when the king of kings would set up his kingdom that would never be destroyed. John, the penman for the last book of the Bible, Revelation, was later shown similar prophecies describing these same successive world powers. God revealed that the great red dragon of Revelation, which gave pagan Rome its power, was indeed the serpent of Eden working through unrepentant men to destroy the Son of God as soon as he was born. Satan had convinced men that God didn't care. It was a dark hour, but into this darkness came the babe of Bethlehem's manger. Into those hopeless skies appeared a star of hope, marking the birthplace of the Son of God, as angels sounded a note of peace and goodwill. And we still wonder at the miracle of that night. It's a mystery beyond the comprehension of man. But that birth, that life, and that death will be the song of the redeemed through countless ages yet to come. The Son of God had promised it. Prophets had foretold it. The faithful of all ages had eagerly looked forward to it. John the Baptist prepared the way for it. Angels announced it. He was indeed the promised one, born of a virgin, raised in Nazareth, and called to the Jordan River to receive the baptism of his cousin John. He faced hunger 40 days, and in a weakened condition was confronted by the tempter of Eden, the enemy of God. He faced the evil one not with might of angels, but with the word of God. It is written. And that's the strength of God's people through all the ages. He drove from his father's house the wicked priests whose greed and senseless traditions challenged the confidence of a sincere at heart in the tokens of God's love represented by the Lamb and other services. Jesus was a teacher, a minister of wisdom, simple wisdom that people understood. His message, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A sermon on a mountain that men would always remember, always trust, not only because the words were true, but because the life was true. He was to every man and woman what God had always desired to express, love and compassion, forgiveness, security in resting and trusting in him. To a woman condemned by priests, scorned and shamed in public, he was a savior, a forgiving God. To children he was a kind and loving friend. To the crippled and the lepers he was the great healer, the one who never turned away anyone who called upon him for help. He taught men the principles of his kingdom, pronouncing a blessing upon the peacemakers, the pure in heart, the humble in spirit, forgave men their sins, healed their diseases, opened the eyes of the blind, 
cast out demons, that possess men's bodies and minds. And finally, the Son of God knelt and washed the feet of fallen man. A few hours later, in Gethsemane's garden, he reaches out to his sleeping followers for a moment of understanding. He is betrayed, condemned, publicly humiliated, tried before Pilate, and then set before the people in contrast to the arch-criminal Barabbas. Urged on by the evil priest, the courtyard mob, forgetting his kindness and mercy, forgetting his life of service, scream, crucify him, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar. A huge wooden cross is thrust upon his shoulders. The journey begins toward Golgotha, where men set out to commit the foulest crime, chargeable to the human race. Nature refused to look upon the scene as its author hung in agony between heaven and earth. With the guilt of a cruel world laid totally upon him, Jesus suffered the awful separation from his Father that sin makes inevitable. He tasted for us the second and final death and rested in a borrowed tomb over that memorable Sabbath from his work of saving men, just as he had rested on the Sabbath of creation from his work of creating man. And then the tomb was empty. It was empty. It was empty. Praise God. At last there surged in man's breast the hope that he could live again. Death was eternally vanquished that glad day. So decisive, so transforming, so world-shaking were the events of that memorable weekend that the newly awakened apostles found themselves the channels of the blessed fire of the Holy Spirit, the gift of God to his church the gift that brings every other gift in its train. However, the world was yet to go through another refining, testing process. Under the Holy Spirit's power, the newborn church triumphed over the pagan world, and glorious is the story penned by the apostles. But then, under the guise of Christianity, the pagan world triumphed over the church again. Described in the revelation under the symbol of the white, the red, the black, and the pale horses. The forms and practices of the mysteries, the occult and the pagan, along with the Hellenistic and Roman philosophies, mingle with Christianity to produce a cruel deception. Rites and ceremonies and doctrines, of which Paul or Peter never heard, crept into the church and claimed the rank of divine institutions. Truth was shaken. The battles between Christ and Satan ebbed and flowed through those dark middle centuries. The forces of evil represented to John in vision as strange and terrible beasts took the field as God's faithful were tortured and banished and burned at the stake by the millions. This tragic story of the Dark Ages no eager man or woman dare leave unlearned today. But again, right prevailed. Faithful witnesses kept truth alive during those dark centuries. Printing was invented. The Word of God was multiplied. As men newly discovered the Word of God for themselves, truth claimed their allegiance, and once again hope dissipated the darkness. Earnest believers who cherished freedom of conscience more dearly than life itself braved the stormy Atlantic in the historic Mayflower, you remember? to write liberty across the skies for all the world to read. Pilgrims, we call them. Then, as humanistic philosophy and tradition began to supersede God's word once more, the march of truth slowed and faltered. Brought to a test during the mid-1800s between adhering to God's word or following the tradition of men, the churches turned back. 
A faithful group of Bible students continued to study, however, searching for light concerning their Savior who had not returned to earth as they had expected. Then through his word, these earnest searchers discovered that Christ had moved as their high priest into the most holy compartment of the sanctuary in heaven to begin his final work for man, investigating the records of his professed followers in ages past. Through the reception of faith in his righteousness and by the transformation of character made possible by the Holy Spirit, they were led into a life of obedience to his commandments and the faith of Jesus. This remnant, the last of the faithful in the long line of the seed of Eve, restored the everlasting gospel through the giving of the messages of the three special angels pictured symbolically in the book of Revelation. Though the message of righteousness by faith was restored, it was largely rejected, and the church slumbered again. As they slumbered, the work of Satan grew. Spiritualism, the occult in all of its many and appealing forms, the restlessness of the nations, rapidly fulfilling Bible prophecy, especially the final scenes described in the book of Revelation, take place with alarming rapidity. The church of God awakens. Hunger strikes and natural disasters torment the uneasy nations. Underground movements erupt with terrorist and radical groups battling out with the vigilantes and the National Guard as the army tries to keep order under martial law. Through the powers of spiritualism, the churches unite to meet the crisis and call upon the government to enact religious laws to bring the people back to God. These laws conflict with the laws of God and the remnant, the faithful ones who would rather die than deny their Lord, are labeled as lawbreakers and subversives, accused of bringing the judgments of God on the land. Oppressive laws are acted against them. As God's people are purified by trial, the Holy Spirit is poured out in its largest measure, and the earth is lightened with the glory of God. God's people are seen with Bibles under their arms, hurrying from home to home, giving the message of God's love to a dying world. Millions respond. The people of God are sealed for eternity. The rejectors of God's message, those who chose the easy popular way, receive the mark of the beast. Satan, fearing his cause is lost, suddenly appears on the earth, masquerading as Christ, calling the people to unite behind him. The shout goes out, Christ is come, Christ is come. He heals the sick speaks words of comfort and insists that the majority are right. This is the almost overwhelming delusion. Then probation closes, and the world is inundated with plagues. The world trembles under these judgments. It appears as though the world will destroy itself. Everything seems out of control. Satan, in brilliant guise, urges that the small group of dissenters must die if the judgments are to stop. Frantically, the governments comply as they sign a death decree. The people of God hurry to the mountains where God protects and feeds them, while the wicked flee in terror before the judgments of God. The whole world is brought to a final conflict as wicked spirits and the Holy Spirit battle for the prize and nations foment in anger and frustration. The moment nears, death stalks the land. Then it happens. The earth shakes violently. The proud cities fall. Fires erupt. All nature seems turned out of its course. But in the east, a small black cloud appears. The saints rush from their places of hiding. He's coming at last. He's really coming. He really is coming. Praise God. The church of God, the truth of God, the people of God triumph in Christ at last. My God is coming And all the angels with him Take me up to heaven with him. My God is coming, 
Those faithful to God from every age are now brought together for a thousand-year reign with Him in the New Jerusalem. The Holy City becomes a universal center of celebration of the victory of God's people over the wicked one. Here the records of earth are opened and the judgments of God with respect to every individual disclosed. While the sins of God's people have been eradicated and forgotten, the records of the unrepentant are there that all might see and confirm God's justice in dealing with every man. The wicked one during this time is isolated upon the earth. Alone with the messengers he has deceived, he must contemplate the ruin of a world and endure the passing of centuries, conscious of the loss he has sustained in his rebellion. As the thousand years draw to a close, Satan again is allowed to exercise his power for a short time. The wicked are resurrected. The earth is repopulated with the humanity of six millenniums. The giants of Adam's and Noah's day, the builders of Babel's tower, powerful pharaohs and kings, kings of Egypt, Babylon, Greece and Rome, the unsaved of every age, those who choose to serve themselves, face another grim morning. They come from the grave as they went into it, aged and diseased, unrepentant and unready to face their God. As the city of God rests upon the earth, the wicked, thinking to take the city, march across the broken surface of the land, ordered in columns under the banner of the master they have long served. And then above them, there appears in the sky a panorama of earth's history of their lives. The events of the great controversy between the evil one and the creator, they see the fall of man in Eden, the penalty paid by Christ. They recall the invitation of God's faithful messenger to accept the mercy of Jesus, and they bow, acknowledging the sovereignty of God, and then, as though hypnotized and mad, they rush relentlessly toward the city of God in a last desperate effort to take it by force, to have it for themselves. As this last act of rebellion demonstrates the control of the evil one over every unrepentant sinner, fire falls in mercy from heaven, and a lake of fire as broad as the world engulfs and destroys it all. It is the separation of the sinner from God forever and ever. Nothing remains as a reminder. Sin and sinner, together with Lucifer, and the disloyal messengers are destroyed. And then the fires of destruction become the fires of recreation. The elements are reduced to their simplest state, and the Creator again prepares the earth as a new, more glorious Eden where man may find a home. The controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. 